All right, so now for this chapter, chapter four, we are on the topic of histology. And before I begin, I just want to say that there, I'm going to be using images from the textbook and also images from this particular website that you see here. Um, so I would highly recommend, you know, after watching this presentation, when you're studying uh, histology and you're trying to understand these various tissues, go to this web page here. It is excellent. There are a lot of very good images um, and definitely more images than what I'm just showing you as well. So I would strongly recommend going and taking a look at this site to really get a just a good visual just to, just just to get a lot of good visuals as to what these tissues look like because um, you know one thing about I mean really really because realistically what histology is is the study of tissues all right and basically when you're trying to study and understand tissues what you're trying to understand is the structure of tissues and the structure uh, obviously plays a role into the function now obviously we've been talking about topics that are leading up so we've got we started more on the more simple aspect of how we're designed from you know atoms to molecules and then on to cells and remember before in chapter three, I mentioned that essentially the sum of, of the activity of our cells is what drives our function. So when you're trying to understand tissues, remember by definition, uh, a tissue is are two or more different groups or types of cells that are put together. And when you put these various cells together, then you form a tissue and a tissue has a specific function. Okay. Um, so, for example, I mean, well, realistically, if you want to understand histology, then you need, I mean, more than just an imagination, you need a microscope. Okay. So, basically, when, you know, when you're looking at these images, these are all images that were taken through a microscope. So, because you need that in order to see cells. All right. So, for example, you know, this is important to understand because let's say you want to look at the difference between cardiac and cardiac muscle and skeletal muscle all right i mean you know to truly get an appreciation for their functions and what they do and how they do what they do not only you know understanding the physiology of cells but their appearance is important okay because remember structure and function complement one another all right so understanding histology comes from, you know, the microscope itself, all right, and looking at the different characteristics of cells. Now, before I start talking about how we differentiate between tissues, you need to understand that there are four primary classes of tissues within the human body, all right? And then the four primary classes of tissues are epithelial tissue, connective tissue, muscle tissue, and nervous tissue, all right? Epithelial, connective nervous and muscle tissue. Now, I'll be talking about all of these four um, in separate videos, but, you know, but bear in mind that, you know, again, we tell these apart by using the microscope, all right? So, that's all histology is. I mean, there's more to it than that, but looking at tissues underneath the microscope. So, let's Oops. Sorry, folks. Okay, so now, basically, in order to understand um, the differences between tissues, in order to identify the difference between nervous and muscle tissue, or even more specifically, you know, muscle tissue, I'll tell you right now, there are three different types of muscle tissue. Okay, there's three different types of muscle tissue, all right? And you know that muscles are used to contract, to generate force, so there's some kind of movement taking place. Okay, so these are so these are tissues that are excitable, that are movable, and how do you tell the difference between them? How do you tell the difference between the three classes of muscle? And again, that comes down because they they all have the same function movement okay so you have to be able to look at the different cellular characteristics so basically you know the the biggest thing you're looking at is what is the cellular composition of a tissue all right what are the various types of cells all right so for example if you want to look at the three different types of muscle tissue you know skeletal muscle is going to look very long and cylindrical cardiac muscle is going to look very short and branched and um, what was I going to say? Smooth muscle cells are very narrow and elongated cells. 
all right and so you have to look at the shape of the cells you have to look at the nucleus of a cell you know skeletal muscle are going to be multinucleated they're going to have many nuclei okay cardiac muscles only going to have one nucleus smooth muscles only going to have one nucleus all right and you have to look at the shape of the nucleus as well because you notice just by looking at these three different types of muscle the nuclei are shaped differently all right you're going to see that in a little bit when i start talking about epithelial tissue as well all right so you have to look at what are the types of the cells and you know and you look at the shapes the you know the shapes of the cells the appearance of the cells you know another thing you take a look at is you know are these alternating light and dark patterns you know on skeletal and smooth uh, on skeletal and cardiac muscle smooth muscle does not have these these uh, alternating light and dark patterns you know that's why we call it smooth muscle it's smooth in appearance so looking at the characteristics of the cells within the tissues itself with the microscope okay but there's more to it than, than just this okay you have to look at the characteristics of the of the extracellular matrix okay now when we say extracellular when we say the matrix um, or extracellular matrix what this is is basically all the non-living organic or inorganic components found outside of cells because remember so let's say i'm looking at a tissue and this is just a cluster of cells all right and then you know let's say you see a bunch of long stringy proteins hanging around here okay that would be a component of the extracellular matrix okay and then you know there's obviously going to be some water in here how much fluid may be in here all right so basically all of the stuff that you find surrounding the cell is the extracellular matrix all the non-living material that is within the cellular environment okay and when you start to put these proteins together i mean because there's there's going to be proteins around a lot of these tissues you're going to form what's called a ground substance all right and essentially this ground substance is basically you know gels okay essentially gels you know and is the ground substance going to be more dense or is it going to be more thin all right so for example if you're looking at bone okay bones going to have a very rough tough dense ground substance because of you know you'll see the cells within bone but then you're going to see the, the the combination of calcium and proteins mixing together and that's going to make for a really really tough rock solid ground substance okay whereas with you know connective tissues depending on the type of tissue you may see uh you know elastic proteins and a loose arrangement of fibers and a very loose ground substance okay so basically are you seeing very thick or thin gels all right or are you just seeing you know solid material what oops are you seeing solid material like in this bone here all right um and then another thing you have to pay attention to is you know besides the cellular makeup the extracellular matrix and you have to pay attention to what's the spacing between the cells okay and you know going back to this to this uh these muscle cells for example you know i'll show you images images of this later on and bring this back but cardiac muscle cells are very widely spaced okay skeletal muscle cells are the kind of you know there's a little bit of space in between them and smooth muscle cells are just piled right on top of each other okay so basically that's another way you distinguish the different types of muscle shapes of the cells the ground substance in between the cells and you know the, the how thick or thin the gels are and how much space is there between the cells itself and when you pay attention to all these characteristics that's how you gain an understanding of histology and you identify the different tissues so pay attention to this the types of you know the the, the shape and types of cells okay what is within the extracellular matrix all right and you know basically are you looking at the proteins okay how thick or thin of a ground substance is formed you know basically how thick or thin are the gels that are in between the cells all right and how much space is there in between the cells of the tissue itself that's how you differentiate between the various tissues of the body all right and um in saying that let's start talking about a very you know the let's start talking about you know the, the 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 different classes of tissue all right the first primary class of tissue i want to talk about is epithelial tissue all right and essentially there are two major types of epithelial tissue um you know the covering and lining and then glandular epithelia i'm not going to go terribly in depth with glandular epithelia just because um 
you know, but you, 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 most of the most of the time, you know, you're going to be talking about the covering type of epithelial tissue. All right, but something in general, when you're when you're thinking about epithelial tissue, think of it as a covering and lining epithelia. Okay or tissue, it's on, found on external and internal surfaces. So for example, let's say, let's say this is a part of your small intestine, all right? You know, the, the small intestine, you know, the very inner lining of the small intestine is going to have a type of epithelial tissue within it, all right? And then on the very outer aspect of the of the intestine there will be epithelial tissue as well different kinds but it's there it's, it's just a lining covering tissue epithelial tissue lines and covers um you know body you know big hollow areas like body cavities okay it's going to line hollow organs it's going to be on the outsides of your organs it's all over the place all right and then again glandular epithelia this is a little different because this is tissue that's actually forming a gland all right, so key, so think of epithelial tissue primarily as a covering type tissue, a lining and covering. All right. Um, now, one thing to keep in mind about epithelial tissue when you're going to be seeing pictures of this and looking at it in a little bit, epithelial the cells of epithelial tissue are very, very tightly packed together. All right. Um, they're very, very tightly packed together. And in fact, they're so tightly packed together that there really is no room for blood vessel and neuro nerve networks in between these, these cells. All right. So there, so there is no real direct blood flow into epithelial tissues. All right. But so there's, so there has to be a way for epithelial cells or epithelial tissues to get their blood and their oxygen. And that's by what's called a basement membrane. Okay, the basement membrane. Now, you have to remember this, that every single type of epithelial tissue that we're going to talk about is anchored to a basement membrane. All right, so keep that in mind. And what the basement membrane is, essentially what it is, it's, a, it's an area, it, it's basically a gel, that, it, a ground substance that you find underneath these epithelial tissues. All right, and directly underneath here, you're going to, I'm going to talk about this more in depth later on, there's always going to be some kind of loose connective tissue all right it's called areolar connective tissue all right and then within this loose connective tissue there you know it's loose so therefore there's room to form blood vessel networks all right so basically directly underneath the basement membrane there are going to be blood vessels and then oxygen can then diffuse up to the cells of the of the epithelial tissue. All right, so that's essentially how epithelial cells get their oxygen, not directly from blood flow, but by the diffusion of oxygen through the basement membrane. Okay, and that's also how they eliminate waste as well. Waste will diffuse, you know, out of these cells into the into the blood vessels underneath the membrane as well. All right, so remember that that the basement membrane is not only an anchoring gel, it's also it's also an exchange medium for these epithelial cells to get their nutrients and oxygen. And like I said, every single epithelial tissue that I'm going to show you is going to have a basement membrane anchoring it. All right? And you know, another thing when it comes to understanding epithelial tissue, you have to understand basically that you can find epithelial tissues as either singularly layered or multi-layered. All right. And so when we say simple, when we say simple, we mean one layer. Okay. One layer of cells. Okay. So this would be an example of a simple epithelial tissue. All right, and then there are some epithelial tissues that are composed of two or more layers of cells, and this is what we would call stratified, okay? So two or more layers, and this is quite easy to see because these cells are going to be, you know, packed on top of one another. But you'll notice on, on here as well on this image that you see this membrane right underneath here. That's the basement membrane, okay? Now, one thing you're going to learn about, for example, when we're looking at the stratified epithelial tissue is that, you know, for most of these, you know, even though these cells up here are farther away from the basement membrane, they can still get oxygen. But there are some stratified epithelial tissues to where if the cells do get too far away from the basement membrane, they will eventually die. All right. And I'll talk about that more in a little while. But, you know, 
keep all that in mind. So simple means one layer of cells. Stratified means two layers of cells, two or more layers of cells. So that's one way that you classify epithelial tissues. You look at, you know, you look at how many layers of cells are within that tissue. And the other way is by looking at the shape of the cells. All right, there are three common shapes, um, cellular shapes that you find within epithelial tissues. There's squamous, cuboidal, and columnar epithelial cells. All right, so this first one. Okay, squamous cells, these are very easy to spot because these are small and flat. Okay, these are small and flat. All right, and you can find these as, you know, in simple or stratified, uh, as simple or stratified within the body. All right, you know, if I, so if I say, for example, simple squamous, basically that's all that is. It's essentially just going to be one thin sheet of flat cells with a basement membrane underneath it. Okay, that's it. Okay, so squamous cells are just simple and flat, or small and flat, or, you know, kind of like a flattened football or a flattened pancake, or pancakes are flat. Um, or they could come as stratified as well. So you would, if you see two or more layers of these small flat cells piled on top of each other, then you would say stratified squamous epithelial tissues. Okay. So, squamous cells. And then there are what are called cuboidal cells. Okay, there's cuboidal cells. You know, cuboid, remember oid. Okay. Oid means to resemble. Okay, so these cells look kind of like a cube. Okay, you know, like a, remember cells are three-dimensional. Okay, so they so they look cube-like in their nature, and then you'd have a nucleus in here somewhere. All right, now they don't look like a perfect cube, obviously, but you get the picture. You know, the histologists say that's what they look like. So now, cuboidal cells in the body typically come as simple. Okay, you you rarely find stratified cuboidal cells in the human body, and I'll show you an example of one that does actually happen. All right. Um, and then the last but not least, there are columnar, okay, and you're really only going to find these as simple, okay, one layer, because these are very, very tall cells, all right. Um, now, typically with cuboidal cells, one thing to keep in mind is cuboidal cells are typically found in, in excretory or secretion type areas of the body, like glands, okay. Um, or the uh, renal tubules, you know, the tubes in the kidney that, that carry out their function. All right. Columnar cells are typically found in areas like this as well, you know, in absorptive areas, you know, like the kidneys or the, or the intestinal tract. Squamous cells are found all over the place. These are covering, you know, you find these primarily in covering and exchange areas of the body as well. All right. Now, one thing you'll also notice about these cells is the nucleus. All right. So when you look at a squamous cell, these small flat cells also have an elongated flat nucleus. All right. Cuboidal cells tend to have a more rounded off nucleus. And these tall columnar cells tend to have the, a long, this doesn't really give a good representation of this, but they tend to have a more elongated nucleus. And the nucleus of a, of a columnar cell is typically found in the lower third of the cell. All right, typically found in the lower third of the cell. So that's essentially how you classify epithelial tissues, these covering lining type tissues. You look at how many layers of cells are within this tissue and what's the actual shape of the cells. And like I said, these are the, these are the shapes that they come in. The cells are either squamous, cuboidal, or columnar. All right. So on that note, let's start to t let's start taking a look at the various types of epithelial cells within the body, or epithelial tissues, I should say. Um, simple squamous. All right. We'll start with simple squamous. So bear in mind when we say simple squamous, what we're saying here is one layer of flat cells one layer of flat cells all right now these are you typically find simple squamous cells um you know and more you know here the book shows an image of the lungs this is called the respiratory alveoli uh simple squamous cells are found all over the place okay they're typically simple squamous cells typically form what are called serous membranes 
Okay, I want to introduce, now this is a word that you get that's very important that you guys need to know because you're going to see this a lot. When you see the word serous, you should think a watery membrane. Okay, you should think that's a watery membrane. All right, so for example, I mentioned earlier um, when I mentioned the small intestine. All right, the small intestine has epithelial tissue lining the inside of it and the outside of it, okay? Now, the outside of the small intestine is lined with simple squamous epithelial tissue, all right, and which, which forms a serous membrane, okay? The outer layer of the heart, okay, has a outer serous membrane around it as well. All right. Now, why is that important? Why is it important to have a watery membrane around these organs? What is it, what do the small intestine and the heart have in common? Think about that for a sec. I mean, you know they're two very different organs, but there is a common feature that they share. The common feature that they share is motility. Okay, these are movable organs, all right? The small intestines are constantly squirming and moving around in your, in your abdomen all the time. The heart is constantly squeezing and relaxing. It's constantly pumping all the time, okay? And you know you've got 20-some-odd feet of small intestine in your gut, okay? So as a result, these serous membranes are important because they produce and release watery secretions around the outside of, of the organs themselves, okay? So while the small intestines are rubbing up against each other or other or, or the or the surrounding tissues in the body cavities that water is going to reduce friction okay because remember wherever there's friction there's wear and tear okay so by reducing friction we reduce the wear and tear on these organs all right same thing with the heart there's a very small volume of serous fluid that's in between your heart and the connective tissue sac called the pericardium that surrounds the heart, all right? But by reducing friction, again, we reduce wear and tear, okay? So like I said, simple squamous uh, epithelial tissue forms serous membranes, all right? Keep that in mind. And, you know, that's it. Again, this is not going to be the last time you're ever going to see this. You're going to see this a lot as you're going through the course of A&P. All right. Now, uh, another area where you find simple squamous epithelia is within the lungs. Okay, and and it forms what's called the alveoli. Okay, the alveoli are essentially, you know, I mean, we have a chapter on the respiratory system, but I'll introduce these. The alveoli are essentially the the in little. They're like little microscopic air sacs within the within the lungs. So you've got bronchioles, the airways that go into your lungs, and then what happens, you pump air into these alveolar air sacs, okay? So you would pump air in it, okay? So air is going to flow in, you know, flow in here. Now, surrounding these alveolar air sacs is a very dense network of capillaries, blood vessels, okay? And you guys are probably starting to get the picture as to what this is for. So we breathe air in, air gets into the alveolar air sacs, and then oxygen diffuses from the alveolar air sacs into the bloodstream, okay? That's how we reoxygenate our blood, all right? And then you know at the same time, Carbon dioxide is diffusing out of the blood into the alveoli. So when we exhale, that's how we get rid of CO2. All right. So what's the so what would be the what's the advantage of having this uh, the simple squamous epithelium in our lungs? This is a very 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 thin membrane. Okay. And by you know by having this membrane being so thin, that allows for allows for a rapid rate of exchange of CO2. And O2, that allows for a rapid exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide, okay? Because it does not take very long for these gases to diffuse across a thin membrane. So we can get oxygen into our blood really quickly. We can get carbon dioxide um, out of our blood really quickly, all right? So that's the advantage of having these, these, these uh, alveolar air sacs comprised of simple squamous epithelial tissue. Very, very quick exchange. All right, so that's simple squamous epithelial tissue. Just you know, essentially either form serous membranes or think of it as forming the the exchange airways in your lungs, the alveoli. All right. Next, I want to talk about simple cuboidal. All right, like I said, this is going to be far more common than um, it's going to be far more common than stratified cuboidal within the body itself, all right? Now, remember, these cells are cube-like in their appearance, 
All right, they're cube-shaped in their appearance. Now, simple cuboidal cells, excuse me, you're going to find these in areas of secretion and absorption as well. So, for example, um, what you see here, this is, a, this is an image of the renal tubules, the microscopic tubules that make up the kidneys, all right? And there's a lot of exchanging going on in the kidneys because basically, so if we just kind of... All right, so if we kind of take a look at the tubules of the kidneys, all right, blood is filtered into the kidneys, all right? And essentially, remember, blood is about 55% water and 45% cells, okay? And within that water, there's a lot of solutes, you know, like amino acids, electrolytes, sugars, bigger proteins, and so on. Metabolic waste products, okay? So essentially, whatever is small enough to be filtered out of the blood flows through our kidneys but we don't want to get rid of all uh, we don't want to get rid of all of these salts all of the water all of the sugars all of the essential solutes that are dissolved in our plasma so what we do is whatever we want to keep in our system whatever flows through these tubules in the kidneys you want to keep is essentially pumped back out to the you know back into the bloodstream all right and then whatever passes all the way through these tubules of the kidneys will eventually be urine and will excrete it all right so the so that you'll find a lot of this within the renal tubules all right various glands um you know the ovaries as well all right so so and remember when we say simple cuboidal we mean one layer of cube shape cells so remember cuboidal means they resemble a cube all right and this is a this is an image from the website i was telling you about of the renal tubules so you can see these cube these cube like cells all right lining these renal tubules okay so like i said that's definitely probably the more common area they're going to be hearing about the simple cuboidal cells is within the is within the kidneys themselves all right and like i said an area of rapid exchange that's the beauty of having only one layer of these cells is that allows for rapid exchange to take place between different body fluid compartments okay And then next, uh, you know, the other, you know, another one, another area of simple is simple columnar, okay? And remember that columnar cells are very tall, okay? These are the tallest of the epithelial cells. And again, you find these just like the other simple epithelia we are talking about in areas of rapid exchange, rapid absorption, okay? Now, the, the major areas where you find this, I would... You know, the biggest area that we would, we would definitely focus on would be the small intestine. Okay, the small intestine is where you do almost, the, almost all of your absorption of the nutrients that you eat. Okay, you know, I mean, you know, then you know, a lot of the water is absorbed into the colon and so on. But, you know, these are highly special. This is a highly specialized type tissue that you find within the small intestine. And what you do is you find these organized as micro, as not microvilli, I'm sorry, as intestinal villi. Okay, these villi, think of villi as, as like these finger-like projections. So if you were to look at a sample of the small intestine underneath the microscope, um, it would look more like this. All right, so you see all these fingers. So let's say here's the small intestine, and here's the inner lining. Now, then here's the lumen. Okay, now when you see the word lumen, that's a new word for you guys. When you think of lumen, think of the hollow, the hollow opening within an organ. Okay, the hollow opening within an organ. All right, so you have all these crisp, they're crypts, these finger like projections that project into the lumen. Okay, and then all along these. These finger-like crypts are lined with, we'll jump back here to this picture, are lined with simple columnar cells, all right? Simple columnar cells, you can see right here, all right? And again, you can see these very long, tall nuclei in about the lower third of the cell, okay? And along the apical surfaces of these microvilli, there is a structure that, or, I keep calling them microvilli, folks, of the villi, the intestinal villi, are, this is why I keep saying this, are cellular extensions called microvilli. 
Okay. Now, what microvilli are? See, this these are really cool because this just makes this tissue even better at its job. Okay, it just makes them even better at its job. All right, because essentially, what microvilli are? They're like these little hair-like extensions all along the apical surface, the outer border of these intestinal villi, these simple columnar cells. All right, and they form what's called the brush border. Okay, because it looks like a brush. All right. Now, what these microvilli are is essentially they're just they're small they're small extensions from the cell and from the apical surface of the cell and they have a protein in them called actin. Okay. So let's talk about the importance of these microvilli. So remember, you know that your small intestine is used to absorb nutrients, okay? So it makes sense that in order to maximize your ability to absorb nutrients, you know, it makes sense that we're designed to have these tall cells projecting into the lumen of the small intestine. Okay, the taller the cells, the higher the chances that whatever we eat and digest is going to come in contact with the absorptive surfaces. Okay, so one, that's the advantage of having these tall cells. Now, this is the even better advantage of having the microvilli is the microvilli just increase the overall surface area of these cells. So what they do is they increase the absorptive absorptive I'm going to abbreviate these abbreviate this surface area. Okay, so again, so by increasing the height of these cells just by this little fraction will increase our ability to absorb nutrients. Okay, and that's why and we're not, so think of that Whenever you see cells with microvilli, you should start to automatically think that, the, that this is a tissue or these are cells that are designed to absorb something. All right. The, these are tissues designed to absorb something. And then within these crypts, there are blood vessels, and then the nutrients are absorbed into the, into the vasculature of our body, and then that's how we introduce the nutrients into our bloodstream. Okay, so like I said, that's where you typically find these simple columnar cells. And then, you know, like I said, these are also found within the, um, you know, within the kidneys as well. And within some of the bronchi, but the most com but, uh, within the bronchi, but the most common area that you're going to definitely see simple columnar are within the small intestine themselves. So very highly absorptive tissue. All right. And then these white cells that you see, Go back here. Sorry, these white cells that you see here actually are, are are what are called goblet cells. Okay, and that's a type of cell that you need to know as well. Goblet cells are mucus, so they they basically produce and excrete mucus. Okay, they're a rare type of a gland because they're a, basically goblet cells are a gland that are made up of one cell. Okay, and then these glands, and I'll show you an image of this later on when I talk more about glands, but these, but goblet cells, they just produce and secrete mucus, and, you know, so there's a, there's a mucosal lining around, around here as well. All right, so that's what goblet, I'm going to come back to goblet cells in a second here, now that we're on to pseudostratified columnar epithelial tissue. Okay, pseudostratified columnar epithelial tissue, that's a mouthful. All right, but let's break this down. Pseudo, okay, that's a that's a prefix that means false. Okay, pseudo means false. All right, now we call this pseudo stratified. Okay, remember when you see the word stratified, that means multi layered. Okay, two or more layers of cells. All right, so we call this pseudo stratified columnar because what it looks like when you look at this under the microscope, this tissue looks like it's multi-layered, but it's really not. Okay, the reason why it looks like it's multi-layered is because you can kind of see here is that there are cells that are very short within this tissue. Okay, and there are so basically every single cell, um, every single cell within pseudostratified originates on the exact same basement membrane, but not every single cell is are the same, but not all the cells are the same height. Okay, there are some cells that are shorter than the others, and that's why it looks like it's multi-layered because the nucleus of these cells are found lower. All right, but like I said, all every single cell originates along the along the basement membrane, which is that's what that is right there. 
Okay. Another name for pseudostratified columnar epithelial tissue, some people like to call it ciliated. Okay, ciliated um, epithelial, ciliated columnar epithelial tissue. Okay, and we call it ciliated because of these projections you see on the apical surface of these cells. Okay, cilia, like microvilli, okay, are found on the apical surface, but cilia are longer. Okay, so let's say here's a microvillus and there's a cilia. All right, so microvilli are used for absorption, okay, because what happens when nutrients come in contact with the microvilli, that actin within the, within the center here contracts, the microvilli shorten, and that helps drag the nutrients within the absorptive cells, okay? What cilia do, cilia are motile, modal, okay? What cilia do is they act kind of like a whip, Okay. All right. So they, so cilia essentially kind of you know whip around back and forth. Okay. I mean they're not like a bull whip that you hear cracking around, but kind of kind of how I how I like to think of this uh, the motility of cilia is let's say you're driving through Iowa. Okay, you're driving through Iowa and you see just you just see these wheat fields as wheat and corn fields as far as the eye can see. All right, and let's say you're driving by a wheat field and there's a good wind going on. All right, and you see that wheat kind of beating back and forth in the wind. Okay, that's how I think about the motility of cilia. Okay, just the constant motion back and forth, back and forth. Okay. Now you find pseudostratified columnar epithelia lining what's called the conducting airways. Okay, that's the most common area where you find this, lining the conducting airways of the body. Okay, conducting airways. Now, we call these conducting airways because this is how it, air passes through these down on its way to the lungs. Okay, now, let's talk about this a little bit. As we kind of, you know, for starters, before I move on, here's the basement membrane. All the cells are anchored in the basement membrane. Underneath, you can see this loose arrangement of connective tissue, and then there are blood vessels and nerves under here, so these cells get their oxygen. Keep that, in, like I said, keep thinking about that. I know I haven't been mentioning that as much as I should have been, but that, there, that all of these that tissues I'm talking about are anchored to a basement membrane. Okay, now, uh, I don't have a good representation of this, but usually within here, there are going to be goblet cells, okay? There are going to be goblet cells within here. And remember, goblet cells are mucus secreting cells, all right? So, what, so basically what's going to happen are they're going to secrete, these goblet cells are going to secrete mucus, and then mucus is going to line these conducting airways, Okay, now one thing to keep in mind about mucus is it's a sticky substance. It's a sticky secretion, okay? It's a very, very sticky secretion. So essentially what happens then is they release, they, what they do is they actually release a protein called mucin, okay? And then mucin combines with water, and you put to do, then you put the two together and you get mucus, all right? Then you get mucus. So... What happens as air is flowing down down our conducting airways towards the lungs, all right, we need to filter and clean that air, all right, because we want to make sure that when that air gets into the alveolar air sacs, that it is as clean as possible so we don't do any damage or harm or infect ourselves, all right. And that's where the mucus comes in, all right. You know, there's a lot of this in the nose. There's a lot in your trachea and your in your bronchiolar circulation. It's all over the place along the conducting airways. Okay, so as air is coming in contact with this mucus, any debris, okay, is getting trapped and stuck in here. And then what happens is the motile, the modal cilia propels the mucus up and out of the conducting airways, and then you're, you're supposed to get rid of it. I mean, you should hawk a loogie if you feel a lung nugget or mucus coming up, okay? You know, it's good to get rid of that, or I mean, swallow it if you want, but, you know, just please don't spit on the sidewalk. I don't like seeing snot on the sidewalk, but, you know, that's, that's why this does come up, okay? And that's why, for example, if you have a, you know, a, a respiratory tract infection, you know, or a chest cold or whatever you want to call them, okay, that there's a lot more mucus coming up because trying to keep this clean, all right? Or if you're ever in an area, for example, I, mean, I remember once I, uh, 
you know, I used to work overnights in college and I uh, lifeguarded and I would go home and sleep for a few hours. And then I, uh, so I lifeguarded as well, I should say on the side. And I would go home and sleep for a couple hours and then get up and go lifeguard. And um, I remember, well, I thought one day, well, I'll just go try to sleep at the school that I lifeguarded at, you know, so I can maybe get an extra half hour, hour of sleep. Well, I remember as I was sleeping in that room, you know, I was, I was kind of sleeping in a coach's room, kind of back tucked away in one of the locker rooms. It was just as dry and dusty as could be. And I sat there and just breathed in a bunch of debris and a bunch of junk for, I mean, hours straight. I could barely even sleep, so it was actually ended up being counterproductive. And for the next probably two weeks, all I was doing was just coughing up mucus like crazy, okay, because of all of that all of that stuff in the air I was breathing in and it was just getting trapped in my mucus. And then as a result, you're trying to eliminate and get rid of it, okay. And, you know, that's why, for example, if you smoke, okay, you know, you, when you wake up in the morning, you have that smoker's cough, okay, because basically when you smoke, the smoke renders the cilia useless, essentially, it just renders it non-functional. So then you're, you're, you're inhaling all of that junk that's in the cigarettes, you know, the smoke and all the other junk that's in it, and then it gets trapped in the mucus, and then when you sleep at night, then you don't have, and you don't bring in the smoke for for a while. Then the then you know people like to say that the cilia wake up, okay. And then you wake up in the morning and you start coughing and hacking like crazy because now you're trying, you know, because you increased your mucus production and you're also trying to get that more of that junk out of there. You cough like crazy in the morning, and that's why you know when you want to get rid of the smoker's cough, you relight and it stops again. Obviously, that's not a good habit to do, but that's just how that works. All right. Um, so that is pseudostratified columnar epithelial tissue. Primarily, think of that as lining the um, lining the airways. Also, you know, you find that within the fallopian tubes of females because um, you know the ova after ovulation are not going to move on their own. They don't have any mo any modal any any means of movement. Um, so think of that as well. All right, so next, so those are all the simple epithelia, the singular layer of cells. Now let's move into the stratified, uh, the stratified epithelial tissue. First, let's talk about stratified squamous, okay? And there are two major types of stratified epithelial tissue, you know, that we'll talk about. Keratinized and non-keratinized. Okay, and these are found in two very different areas of the body. Okay, first let's focus on the not uh, the non-keratinized. Okay, so stratified squamous and non-keratinized. Think of this as being found in wet areas of the body. Think of this as being found in wet areas of the body, like the oral mucosa. Okay, the inner lining of the Vagina. When I say oral mucosa. I mean the mouth. Okay. Um, excuse me. So you know the lining of the esophagus, the lining of the small intestine. Okay. Those are all wet, slippery areas of the body. All right. Now the, this is the reason why we call this non-keratinized. So here again, you can see that there's a basement membrane down here. And then you see all this loose connective tissue, and there would be blood vessels in here. All right, now, non-keratinized. So obviously the cells that are closer to the basement membrane are, are closer to their source of oxygen. So these are going to look the healthiest. All right, but then, but now one thing about epithelial tissue uh, that I did not mention before is that epithelial tissue is a very high turnover type tissue, meaning a very rapid rate of mitosis. Okay, we're constantly turning over epithelial tissues all the time. Like, for example, the stratified squamous, you know, this tissue here that you see that lines your stomach, I mean, you turn this over about every two to three days. Okay, very, very rapid rate of turnover. All right, now, as these new cells, 
um, there are these mitotically, these very mitotically active cells in the lower parts, as they continuously divide, the old cells are pushed up and away. And you can see, as you're working your way up here, the cellular changes that are taking place. You can see these cells look different. Okay, what they're essentially doing is they're slowly dying, and as they're doing this, you can see morphological or physical changes within the cells, all right? And then once you get to this very upper layer, all right, now these cells are still alive, okay? That is the big difference between non-keratinized and keratinized, all right, is the upper layer of cells is essentially, well, that besides your location you find them in, is these, these cells are still alive. They're just going to be sloughed off before they die, all right? So keep that in mind. So a very, very thick, dense layer of, um, of flat cells, and all the cells are still alive within the tissue, all right? And you find these in wet, slippery areas, like the lining of your stomach, small intestines, your GI tract, your esophagus, okay, the mouth, the vagina, and so on, all right? And then the next, whoops, the next one, then stratified squamous keratinized, okay, this is what you want to think of as your skin, okay, this is your skin. Okay, and more specifically, the epidermis of your skin, the upper layer of your skin. Okay, because your skin is broken down into three layers, the epidermis, dermis, and depending on what book you read, the hypodermis. Some people don't recognize the hypodermis as a true layer of skin. Some people just lump them together for the sake of discussion. All right. Now, essentially, this tissue has two main functions. All right, basically, it adds as a retardant to water loss and as a external barrier. Okay, so now, skin does not prevent water loss; it only hinders it. Okay, that's what the word retard means. Means to hinder. Okay, because you have to remember, we sweat. Okay, that's controlled water loss. All right, and it's a physical barrier. It prevents pathogens from basically prevents pathogens from getting in us and, and infecting us, all right? And so think about this with third-degree burns, okay? This is why third-degree burns are so dangerous because once you lose this, this external physical barrier, okay, you lose your ability to shield yourself from pathogens outside your body, and you're, it's just you, you lose water very easily, okay? Because you got to remember, there's a lot of water in the tissue spaces underneath your skin. That's why the two biggest, when it comes to patient care with third-degree burns, those are the two most critical aspects, infection control and water control. All right. So stratified, so you can see that this here, this looks significantly, significantly different than the non-keratinized. All right. So what you're looking at here are... And I'm, I'll talk about this more in depth in the next chapter because I'm going to do a, a brief video lecture on the skin as well. But what you're looking at here, again, this is where the basement membrane would be located. All right. And then, as I mentioned before, the most, act, the most cellular activity occurs around the basement membrane, which makes sense because you're closer to your fuel source, your source of oxygen. All right. So what's happening then are these keratinocytes, that's what you call the... That's what you call the most abundant type of cell within the epidermis, within your, you know, the upper layer of your skin. These keratinocytes are very mitotically active. They're dividing like crazy, okay, at a very rapid rate, I should say. So then again, as these, as your, as the, as mitosis is taking place and you're developing new cells, the old ones are pushed up, up and away. All right. Now this is the difference: is before, before we slough off the oldest of the cells. All right they die, okay, they die, and then they're very densely packed together, and you, there's a protein that you find within these cells, and that's keratin, okay, that's why we call them keratinized, these are dead, tough cells, all right, and then what happens then, and this is where that physical barrier comes in right here, all right, that's where the physical barrier is, all these really tough protein packed cells that are very tightly packed together, you know, again, you know, retard water loss and act as a great barrier to prevent pathogens from getting in, all right, and this is a more, uh, uh, it gives you a better visual of all the layers of skin, and this is, this would be thick skin because the dermis is very thick in this area, all right, so again, this would be the basement membrane, this is where the all this is where you find the most of the cellular activity. 
old cells being pushed away, and then eventually they'll die, pack together, and then the dead cells will exfoliate off. Okay. And then, as I mentioned earlier, you know, as, as I've been saying, that underneath the basement membrane, all this loose connective tissue, and then within that loose connective tissue, there are blood vessels, and again, that's where oxygen gets in. All right. So keep that in mind. Stratified squamous keratinized epithelial tissue. Stratified cuboidal is not going to be a common type of tissue that you're going to see in the human body. All right, You'll really find it in some sweat and, and mammary glands and within the testes of the males. All right, And it's usually not terribly thick. Okay, it's usually, I mean, within sweat glands, it's, you know, sweat and mammary glands, it's usually only about two, two layers thick. Okay, but remember, multi-layered, that meets the minimum. So, for example, these are, these are, these are sweat glands that you would find within the skin. All right, and you can see the multi-layered nature of the sweat glands in here. So, again, these are really the only areas you're going to find it. Now, within the seminiferous tubules of the testes, though, oh, shoot, sorry. Within the seminiferous tubules of the testes, you'll notice that there are a few more cells packed on top of each other. All right, so stratified cuboidal. All right, this, the, the seminiferous tubules are essentially for, you know, sperm. This is where sperm production and transport takes place within the testes. All right. But again, that's what these are comprised of. But those are really the only areas of the body where you're going to find this. All right. You know, so... I don't really feel the need to talk a whole lot about that then. So let's move on to transitional epithelium. This is the coolest one out of them all, I think, anyways. And I say this because we call this transitional epithelium because the shape of these cells can change depending on basically the how much stress you apply to these cells. All right. So, for example, with transitional epithelium, you, either, you find these cells as either round or flat. Okay, it's round or flat, and you you know typically you think of transitional epithelium as being found within the urinary system, you know within the urinary bladder, okay within the ureters, okay and the urethra. All right, now here you notice the cells are fairly rounded, okay the cells are fairly rounded. So what that tells us then is that let's say let's say we're looking at a let's say we're looking at the urinary bladder here. All right, what this is telling us is that the bladder is rather empty. Okay, the bladder is empty. All right, but as you fill the bladder up with urine, okay, so for example, you can see these kind of flat, round cells. This would be the transitional epithelia right here. All right, basement membrane, tissues, and so on. Okay, so what you're seeing here is an empty bladder. Now, as the bladder, so let's say you, you start to fill this bladder with urine hopefully your urine's not blue okay what's going to happen is the bladder is going to have to stretch okay and the reason why it stretches is that's because of the cellular makeup of the transitional epithelial cells okay because these are flexible cells so as you apply pressure to them they're able to go they're able to go from being round to more elongated and flat Okay, so as these cells are stretching out, all right, that, that's what makes the bladder expand. All right, and then eventually what will happen is the bladders are going to expand to a certain point. It will reach a certain threshold, and then it will send nervous impulses up to our brain, and then that will make the detrusor muscle around the bladder contract, and then as the bladder starts to squeeze, that's how urine is expelled out. Okay, and that's the beauty of having these cells within the urinary system is this allows us to fill and not have to always void ourselves. I mean, every time 100 mils of urine gets in there. All right, so that's why we call them transitional epithelial tissue is because the cells can transition from round to flat, okay, depending on how much force is applied to them. Okay, so that's essentially the covering epithelia. You notice that's the pattern you saw here with these various types of epithelial tissues. You saw that, that, that essentially, you know, that these were just sheets of tissues 
covering different areas of the body. You know, covering the inner lining of the small intestine, the stratified squamous epithelial tissue, or the simple squamous epithelial tissue, covering the outside of the of the intestines. All right, you know, the cuboidal tissues, you know, making up sweat glands, lining the inner lining, you know, forming the inner lining of the renal tubules. All right, the transitional epithelium we just talked about, lining the, the, the hollow tube work of the urinary system, the urethra, the uh, ureters, and the bladder, and so on. You know, again, you know, as I mentioned, epithelial tissue, think of this as primarily a covering type tissue. All right, and again, you just identify the differences, you know, between them by looking at one, you know, the number of, of layers of cells, okay, and then the shape of cells, okay. So that's how you basically understand epithelial tissues. Then you have to constantly look at pictures and images so you can, so you can start tying all this together. All right. And then the other type of epithelial tissue, I'm not going to spend a ton of time talking about, but I'll mention it, is glandular epithelial tissue. So glands are comprised of one or more cells. Um, and basically what these cells do or what these glands do is they release their secretions. Okay. And basically we classify glands based on their structure and, 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 the, and the distance of secretion. Okay. That's endocrine and exocrine. Okay. So for example, and endocrine gland, this is a gland that essentially what it does is, so let's say we got, oops, probably put my eraser down. We've got this gland here. And what endocrine glands do is they, I mean, think of an endocrine gland as secreting hormones. Okay. And they, what they do is they secrete their hormones and they diffuse into your body tissue fluids. Okay. And then nearby, there are going to be blood vessels. Okay. So then these hormones are going to diffuse into the bloodstream, and then they're going to travel a long distance. Okay, they're going to travel a long distance toward their, what we call targets. Okay, their target cells, target tissues. And then these hormones are going to carry out some kind of an effect. Okay, so, so endocrine glands just release their secretions into bodily fluids, and these secretions, i.e. hormones, diffuse into the blood and travel over a long distance. Okay, whereas exocrine glands, exocrine glands, what they are, again, epithelial tissue, but they're, they have ducts, okay, and what these ducts do is they open up to other body surfaces, okay, they open up to other body surfaces. Now, this is, now, don't get in the habit of saying exocrine glands release their secretions outside of the body. Yeah, a lot of the examples that we'll mention and that you'll see are traveling to the outside of the body, but I'll talk about the pancreas here in a second. Okay, so essentially what's going to happen is they're going to release their secretion, and let's say this is a very generic representation of a sweat gland. This the sweat is going to travel over a short distance through a duct and then onto another body surface, you know, the outer surface of our skin. All right, so you'll notice that, you know, that exocrine glands move their secretions through ducts over short distances to other body surfaces. Now, the pancreas, on the other hand, let's say we got a stomach here. Hope your stomach doesn't look like this. Pardon my art here, folks. Um, and then you've got your pancreas. Okay. Now, the pancreas is a unique gland because it's what we call mixed. Okay, a mixed gland has both endocrine and exocrine functions to it. Okay, about 98% of the, of the job of the pancreas or the function of the pancreas is exocrine. Okay, so the main job of the pancreas is it, is it assists the small intestine in digestion. Makes it easier for the small intestine to digest and absorb nutrients. So what it does is it produces it basically digestive enzymes and buffers and it carries them through a duct into the lumen of the small intestine, okay? So we're moving from this, this bigger gland into another body surface, okay? Pancreatic secretions should not be going outside of the body. Folks, if that's happening, please go seek help, all right? So that's an example of, of an exocrine gland moving a secretion to another body surface, not outside of the body, okay? And the other 2% of the pancreas is endocrine, you know, that's what you think about, you know, with insulin and glucagon, okay?
So that's how we classify glands. You know, are there, you know, is there duct work? Are the, are the secretions, or, and are the secretions traveling very far? All right. And, you know, most glands in the body are multicellular. You know, very few glands are single-celled, you know, like the goblet cells is the example I used earlier. All right, and this is the representation of the goblet cell that I talked about. So essentially what this, this single-celled um, gland does, so here would be your nucleus. Here are your mitochondria. Okay, and this is your rough endoplasmic reticulum. And all of this is the protein that we call mucin. All right. Now remember, back to chapter three, when I was talking about cells, remember I said the main job of a cell is to produce proteins. Okay, protein synthesis. So you've got the nucleus with the DNA, that's a code to drive protein synthesis. You've got the mitochondria to fuel the process, because remember, for every amino acid you make, you have to burn one ATP. All right, and remember we said that proteins that are made on the rough endoplasmic reticulum, these are proteins that are going to be made for export. All right, and that's why you've got some Golgi here as well, because remember the Golgi package proteins and, you know, get them out of the cell. All right, so now you've got all this packaged mucin, and it's going to be excreted out of the out of the goblet cell itself and remember we said these goblet cells are found within the small intestine and the well primarily the small intestine and the respiratory mucosa you know within that pseudo stratified columnar epithelial tissue all right so that's essentially how a goblet cell works and this is this kind of review of what we already discussed all right so, again, would this be an endocrine or an exocrine gland? Would this be endocrine or exocrine? Think about this. How far, is it, what's the distance of travel? Short distance. Right? Short distance. And there isn't necessarily a true tube or duct, okay, because essentially what these goblet cells do are via exocytosis, is they, you know, release these proteins, the protein mucin. All right, and remember, mucin plus water equals mucus. Sorry, probably can't read that, but you get the picture. All right, and then this mucus is secreted. You know, let's say this is the respiratory mucosa. All right, is secreted to the, along the cilia as we breathe air in. It traps it, and then the cilia get the, get the mucus with all the trapped debris out of there. Okay. So keep that in mind that, you know, so that's an example of an exocrine gland. And then here are some images of some other exocrine glands of the body. And, I mean, we can classify these exocrine glands based on their structural complexity, um, how many branches there are. You know, there are, you know, these are obviously the multicellular glands. So these are basically single branched, you know, some just have more than one single branch. Um, excuse me. You know, so, you know, and then these are what we would call compound tubular. This would be an example of a mammary gland. Okay. You know, here, these would be various intestinal glands. This would be, you know, these would be, you know, the uh, kind of like what we call the gastric pits of the stomach. All right. And then you've got... You know, then you've got these alveolar glands, and then you've got very compound alveolar glands. Okay. Um, you know, again, I'm sorry, I mixed this up. These would be, you know, these would be the uh, mammary glands down here, and then these would just be more complex intestinal glands. All right. So kind of keep that in mind. And then basically the how these glands release their secretions, um, you know, these exocrine glands, they can do it through what are called holocrine or mecrine. Um, mecocrine. So basically, um, if we're talking about a, a mecrine gland, essentially what they do is, so let's say we, so what these are cells that, that do their job via exocytosis. So basically they package proteins and export them out. Okay. With a holocrine gland, what you see here, so let's say here's a gland and they're just it's packed with cells. What holocrine glands do is, this, is the cells in the upper surface, these actually break open and die 
okay, and then all the secretions and everything else within the cells are released, okay, but there really aren't any glands inside the body that do this outside of what are called sebaceous glands. Sebaceous glands are oil-secreting glands, all right, so, and again, that's not really as terribly as important to remember, I'm just bringing it up, but, so that is essentially an introduction into histology and a little talk about, you know, the, the various epithelial tissues. Again, if you folks have any questions about this, you know, again, don't hesitate to ask.